Thanks for joining me for the second episode of The Replate, where I'm continuing my conversation with Joe Felisco on the fundamentals of playing the harmonica. Thank you for all the positive feedback and comments we received from episode one. And in this pod, Joe and I discuss his second fundamental, which is active blues breathing, along with various other tangents we take along the way, including beginning with a, a chat about Paul Butterfield. And also we talk about Little Walter and the fact that his breathing technique is often overlooked as part of his genius and what allowed him to do what he did. We're going to rejoin the conversation just as we wrap up the first fundamental. I've intentionally kept the editing to a minimum so you can hear the energy and atmosphere between Joe and I as we're working our way through these five fundamentals. I really hope that comes across in the recording. So let's dive into episode two, active blues breathing. Okay, so that's chords, the first fundamental area. So obviously a huge and rich, uh, rewarding area. So we've been speaking for an hour and we're on the first one. I thought this might happen, so I just wanted to check in uh, with you. So I, I think if, if you've got time, we should carry on going. Uh, I'm happy, sure. but I, ju- I was just mindful of time. But I think if we want to do it like this, we're going to have to do it over you know, another session and maybe, maybe another and release it across two or three parts. Um, I'm really enjoying it. How do you feel? You're getting across what you wanted? I'm enjoying myself immensely. I, I this is such a pleasure for me to connect with you. Um, I, I swear, anytime I've ever uh, been with you and have spoken, it is just so rewarding. It's so rewarding for me. Oh, you're so, you're, you're you're so kind. But even then, right? Listening to you play that rhythm, okay? I I mean, I've listened to Sunny Terry, you know, a lot. Um, not, not as intensely as, as you have. And I had a lot of help from Paul Lamb who plays that style, you know, very well, I think he really, you know, drummed it into me that it, you don't, it doesn't have the same sentiment as Chicago blues. It's a different, right. he, he said, right. he was he's like, Lee, people dance to this music. It's got to have that, it's got to have that bounce. Right. And, and if it's too angular and, and, and blah, 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 it's, it's not about that. You've got to, you've got to really think about your breathing in a different way. And Paul, Paul really went on at me about that, which obviously helped my playing. But even now listening to you play that to my ears, I'm, I'm not even in the same galaxy in terms of the, the nuances and the chordal patterns to what, to what you're doing. It's, there's so so much there. I got the basic groove, but there's a lot of depth which which comes ac- across there. So it's fantastic to be able to have these kind of conversations and, and bounce those things uh, around, and not to be. I guess it's people's reaction to knowing, like, the learning journey never ends. So some people will be disheartened by that, I guess, and other people will find that kind of. I don't know, uh, inspiring in a way. And, and I, and I have this curiosity, you know, still to learn things and, and go, oh, oh, hold on. <laughs> I, I haven't actually got that. <laughs> I thought I got it down, but I haven't. Um, and I think that's why these, these kind of conversations amongst players and players to be honest with themselves and have that curiosity of saying, okay, I, I've got that little Walter solo down or I got that Sonny Terry riff and then you come back to it and then you're like, mm, actually I haven't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you, you'd agree. Oh, I totally agree. I, part of why I'm doing this is just out of sheer frustration of how uninformed people are about these early players. And right. they just are so dismissive of them. And uh, I, I love Paul Butterfield and what he did, but he, he didn't take it to a higher level. He, he did his thing fantastically as he did on a lower level of what was going on with these other players. And, and I just want it, to it, be, ch- I want to challenge just, people and just like let people know all the layers that are going on in these early styles that I think most people miss. So someone like Paul Butterfield, obviously a a brilliant, much loved player and the Paul Butterfield blues band, very innovative, you know, at at the time and Paul Butterfield's amazing singer. But in terms of what he was doing on the harmonica, 
I think what you're saying there is because of the way he played, which is around single notes, he wasn't tapping in to these wider possibilities. It was, it was, it was very, it was very specific. I guess that's what you, that's what you're saying. Um, I would best answer that question by saying he was, uh, if he was a piano player, he would have been one of the best piano, one fingered piano players in the whole wide world. But I also know by listening to his recordings, how much he loved Chicago blues and how much he loved little Walter. But I just don't think until later on in his career that he realized what was going on with the tongue blocking. I don't think he realized. Right. Of course, I don't know. It's just my theory. And I'm happy to discuss with people or, or argue with people or people that don't want to agree with me. That's perfectly fine. I just, I want to understand it as deeply as possible. And I know that many of those very early players from the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s are not understood in terms of the layers of technique that they have. Uh, it makes me happy too to hear you talk about Paul Lamb sort of critiquing you about Sonny Terry. And this is the same thing I find myself saying. And I, I think Paul Lamb is brilliant. I, I think he completely gets it for what it is. And, and that is, you can't take Chicago blues technique and put it on Sonny Terry and expect it to work. It's not, no. not that. It's not. But that. you but you do hear people do that, right? You hear yeah. like yeah. especially when people do country blues or fox chase stuff amplified, which to me always sounds bizarre. But when you take that sentiment to it, it just to my ears, you lose that kind of rolling, smooth, leaning forward. A rhythm it's almost it's almost evocative of i'm probably taking it too far now but if you think about where that music comes from in terms of that open space and the and, uh, and the sound it's it, it's and chicago sounds obviously a very urban thing and it's just a bit more angular in a you know in a way and it's got a different type of attack to it whereas you know the the where that music is played at barn dances and pe people were you know dancing on the front porch or enta entertaining them stuff that's what paul was always going on about in terms of that sentiment which comes back to that breathing and chordal approach when you accept that you it's not about tearing into the harmonica in the way that you might do if you're doing big water or, or, or something like that you really have to tap into all the techniques you were talking about around the the, the tonal variations through the con you know the consonants and the vowels and the different types of pulses that's what really makes that rhythm that chord of playing come alive is all those different techniques that you've talked about. And just to really drive the nail home, it's that thing of like, oh, chords, and I'm just breathing in and out, how much can there be to it? And actually, it's, and there's a lot, there's a lot there. There's, a, there's, a, there's things that will stay with you right through your playing uh, career, right? Yeah. I, I think you might be, um, missing the breath pulse thing of the Sonny Terry. Um, I, I consider at least half of what he does is being related to old time music. So there's really that emphasis on the backbeat that you don't hear in Chicago blues uh, in quite the same way. So when you, when you hear this chording rhythm, <laughs> There's that, yeah, you got there's that push there happening. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, pro and, I probably that, trashed the recording there with the clapping, but I can't, yeah. Yeah. That, that's not what you, you don't hear that in other harmonica styles. So if you don't really pay very, very close attention to it, then you, then you miss that rhythmical nuance. The back bit. Yeah, and when, and when you get it, and when you di dial into that, same, I guess, with... Um, folk players i'm thinking of people like joel anderson you know brendan powell when when you've got that it almost sounds like a fiddle combined oh, yeah. with the, the 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 accordion it is just so fantastic <laughs> to hear but also to play when you start to tap into some of these th th these things the whole thing sort of pops and just coming back to the tongue blocking thing the other th important thing about it is that it, not only does it 
open up possibilities that you cannot get if you are only lip pursing, irrespective of whether you think it sounds um, better or not. But what it also does is it fundamentally changes your connection and relationship to the instrument. You know, if you, if you can feather the notes, the way you fire notes, the way you can sculpt notes, if you're incorporating tongue blocking on, on whatever level, a, a little bit or a lot, it, it just changes your connection to the instrument. In, and, and it's the equivalent of a, of a guitar playing with a plectrum or using their, you know, their, their fingers. It's a different kind of connection to the instrument, I think. Oh, well, like you said, you know, a pick or all, all your fingers. Um, piano with one finger or all of them. Uh, mm. I think in a, in a way, actually, just listening to you speak about this idea of the early players were, were actually getting more out of the harmonica in some ways because they're using the, these techniques. And when we think about modern players being around single notes, in a way, in some senses, if we think about the evolutionary part of the harmonica, and I, and I guess this is what you're sort of passionate to get people thinking about and, and, and what you're doing with your teaching is in a way, in some areas that, the evolution of the harmonica has gone backwards in terms of what it's capable of because of, because of this focus on the single note play. So yes, we've got overblowing and we've got, you know, new types of harmonicas coming out and thinking of people like Brendan Power really pushing the instrument forward in incredible ways. But when we think about those early players and what they were doing with what, what's there and thinking about using, using their tongue, would you say in a way over time in, in an evolutionary way, we haven't necessarily progressed. We've, we've kind of lost things in a way. Um, yes, I would agree with that. Uh, but I can understand why it happened that way. Uh, if you look at where the harmonica was popular in music, I think most people would agree that it really reached a peak in blues, especially Chicago blues, because a harmonica player was part of the band and he was expected to play all the time. So this is a radical statement, but I really do believe this. Uh, the first guy that you had that was really doing that um, on an amazing level was little Walter. How are you going to get better than that? So as Chicago blues changed and the economic situation of blues changed, the role of the harmonica player became less important in blues. So you don't have guys uh, practicing learning to be accompanists and the, the role of the harmonica just sort of got pushed back to like a background singer. They might play in between the holes, um, and certainly this is what happened with the harmonica in country music with the popularity of Charlie McCoy. The harmonica was in a lot of stuff, but right. it was not an instrument that was part of the rhythm section. It was like a horn where they're playing fills here and there on occasion. And so if that is what you're doing as a harmonica player, then you're not learning the art of playing all the time in a tasteful manner that is making the band happy. So that you're sort of, it, you're sort of being squeezed out of a job because you're not learning to be an accompanist. And so therefore it's, it's, it's crumbling down upon itself. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. It's very, very interesting. Yeah. Especially when you bring in the cultural aspects and the circumstances and the economics of it, it's a, yeah, yeah it's a, a complex situation. So the next, item joe that you've that you've got on the fundamentals is what you call active blues breathing so do you want to explain a little bit about what you mean by that and what's involved i feel like how to properly breathe when playing the harmonica is uh never really been explained and it's a terribly misunderstood subject Maybe the best place to start is to identify uh, what right now I'm calling three areas of breath placement. 
Okay. And let's start with relaxed, which is where we are right now. We're not exerting ourselves. We have a small amount of air in our lungs. We're kind of in the middle. So the most, the next most natural thing to do is to fill up with air full. And then when you get to that place where you can't uh, inhale anymore, then that is obviously you're full of air. I, I almost think of it as like the little dial on your dashboard of your car right. that talks about how much gas you have. Right. You know? So you, you fill up with air, your diaphragm is using to maximum fill up, and then you go back to relaxing again. And then basically the diaphragm relax, the air comes out. So this also happens to be the upper range of one's breathing, uh, your upper range, where you go from being relaxed to full of air. Well, this is where most people, in my opinion, play the harmonica from. They get stuck between being relaxed and uh, quickly going to their full up position, the full up range, uh, full up area, actually. To anybody that's a uh, beginner or intermediate player, uh, if they in any way have come to a conclusion that playing the harmonic is tricky, they might self-sabotage their own attempts to play better by bringing the harmonica to their mouth and then inhaling before they go to inhale. Well, that is a a uh, terrible situation to be in because it makes no logic. It's like if you are going to try to jump and you straighten your legs out before you go to jump, uh, yeah. you, you, it, it doesn't work. There's nothing there. Yeah. But I've observed so many times that it's just, it, I no, nearly observe this all the time that people that are struggling to play bluesier styles on the harmonica, they won't let go of that air. They get stuck holding air in their upper range of breathing. They let a little bit out and then they might even breathe in again and, and they're just stuck here. And that really brings on a full blown disposition of being tense and completely unrelaxed and they don't know how to get out of that. So it was through transcribing, actually, uh, little Walter instrumentals, um, a couple of them that really jumped to mind were Blue Midnight and Sad Hours, when I was really realizing that there are some choruses that to my ear, 95% of everything he's playing is an inhaling note. Right. And, and it really like kind of got me thinking about, wow, that is, that's powerful. I don't know what to make of it yet, but that is a really powerful thing. And I found as a player, as a younger player, I just learned to anticipate in advance the ability to dump this air out before I was going to play a long inhaling phrase. So this and is so, the empty. So this is the empty mode, or, or this, is this is the empty mode. Right. This is not natural. It is the hidden range of playing the harmonica that I do know. If you listen to Kim Wilson's playing, for example, you can clearly hear he knows how to get rid of that air and access the lower uh, range of his playing. But I'm not sure he's conscientious that he's doing that. Also, if you pay attention to accordion players, especially diatonic accordion players, it's just basically a harmonica with a bellows. Yeah. The accordion players have a little device on there that they control with their thumb, which allows them to very quickly expel air or pull air into the bellows to allow themselves to be in a position that they can squeeze longer or they can pull longer by right. the way they use that uh, air valve. So that's something to keep in mind because that relates to two words that I use when I teach the harmonica. One is called exhale push and the other is called nose push. 
And these really kind of relate to how accordion players go about playing. Exhale push is the mindful and controlled act of squeezing the maximum amount of air out of your lungs before you go to put the harmonica in your mouth and play. And of course, it doesn't mean squeezing the air out, then gasping half of it back in before you go to play. It means right. squeezing the air out and letting it come back in in a controlled manner. So, 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 this, so this is important because it gives you the option creatively, or if you want to play a song like Sad Hours, which has a lot of long, 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 long notes, that your starting position, if it is the relaxed position, you're not, you're not tapping into the full capacity of your, your lungs. So by, by actively pushing all of that air out, what, what, what I think you're saying is that you're then going to find it much easier to you're, effectively you're, you're creating a bigger tank into which you can pour more air. So you can, you can hold that draw for, for example, for much longer. And there's, there's something a hundred percent I did not think about, you know, for a long time. And then as you improve, you, you, you find yourself probably subconsciously picking up these techniques and I, and I'm sure I, you know, I do, I do do it but it's not something that was necessarily taught or spoken about here. So in a sense, what you're saying is that you've got these, when we think about breathing and the, and the lungs, you've got these different states and people are experiencing the, 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 the extreme of being full with air. That's probably happened. Something. Although people, I think if you're playing lots of fast notes, you're probably never really getting into that thing. And something we'll, we'll get into when we talk about, single note playing being able to sustain a note is often overlooked it's such a powerful thing that the harmonica can do but i would imagine most most of us do not experience the extreme end of having no air because of the conscious decision to to to, to make it right uh, that's my finding um i call that the asphyxiation reflex it is your body's uh natural natural reflex to say i need air and if you're playing the harmonica and you're a little tense and distressed about it the body says uh oh you need even more air so you you really have to learn to go into that lower range of breathing and very carefully work your way out of it Here's a very simple thing you can do. Pick a chord, a split, something. Take the biggest inhale breath that you can and then play a split, a chord, a note, exhaling for as long as you can maintain it at a reasonable volume, a reasonable equal volume and time yourself. I bet that there's plenty of people that can do it for 20, 30 seconds. So why can't you do it for 20 or 30 seconds inhaling? If you can do it exhaling, you should be able to do it inhaling. Yeah. Uh, but your body gets really ornery. It gets really, you know, ornery with you when you try to do it inhaling because it wants that air in quicker. Right. Yeah. So that's that's super interesting. And I, I so you were just about to explain something else. You talked about the the um, exhale push in relation to an accordion, and then I took us off on a tangent. This is the idea of the nose push, which I guess yeah, is. Uh, the nose push is very closely related to the exhale push, but that's just where instead of taking the harmonica out of your mouth and then exhaling there, you're actually using an exhale note or split to, as a facade to hide the fact that you're actually getting rid of air out of your nose. Uh, you can t totally hear this throughout uh, a lot of harmonica players. Sunny Boy 1, uh, Little Walter, you can hear tons of that kind of stuff going. And quite literally, I think that's the best way to look at it. They're, they're not necessarily playing the note because they want that note. They're using it as a facade 
to hide the fact that they're breathing so they can go back to the more expressive areas of the harmonica, which are predominantly all inhaling, in my opinion. And do you, do you think this is a technique that they just develop them themselves? Because a, a, a lot of these people are self-taught, right? They, they weren't going yeah. to harmonica school. Um, obviously, there's no YouTube. Obviously, certain techniques and things were handed down, but certainly people like Little Walter took, took it in a new direction, you could say. He was a new branch of the genome. Uh, in, a, in a way. So do you think that th this was just something they just did naturally or something that a technique that they might, I mean, this is pure supposition, uh, I guess, but. Uh, my best guess would be that they had gigantic ears and they recognized that when they were exhaling, the intensity of the bluesiness, the blues horsepower dropped. So if they were going to exhale on the harmonica, then they may as well make sure that they're doing something productive. So I said blues horsepower. Let me just remind people that on holes one through five, or if you want to include hole six, uh, there are no blue notes. Uh, uh, you could make the argument that six hole with the overblow is a flat third, but on the lower range of the harmonica, all your blue notes, your flat seven, your flat five, your flat three, those are inhaling notes. Yeah. So all that greasy, smoky, filthy, ornery, bluesy stuff is all inhaling. So you can hear uh, where little Walter, John Lee Williamson are using that three hole exhale or even the four exhale as a place to get rid of air. You can even hear Paul Butterfield doing it, going to that four blow all the time. And to me, that's just a vehicle for exiting air. When I listen to myself play, I end quite a few licks on that blow four, partly just because I think it sounds cool. <laughs> if it didn't, I wouldn't do it. But it, it has that bonus of, uh, you know, setting you up for the next thing. But yeah, this, this is a super interesting area for me in terms of the 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 third area the excel the exhale position for one of a better word as a kind of fundamental understanding that again something as simple as breathing actually you've got these different registers and 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 to be aware that you've got this third third dimension of really going to the extreme of having no air in your body as opposed to uh something you routinely experience by breathing in a lot. I think, I think that's a super interesting area. I, I, also, I want to make just a very brief point that I, I don't want to make this too much about me. Really, I would really prefer that people listening uh, walk away from this realizing that little Walter was a genius on countless levels. And I'm just pointing out another level of his genius. It's, it's, I, got this really listening and learning from him why was he such a great player and it's easy to talk about his licks and his jazzy influence and his position playing but nobody really ever talks about what a skillful jedi breather the guy was so i i really want to make it be more about him than about me yeah but, but you've got to crack the code to do that and put it in a way that could, people can understand, which because you do so much teaching, you're, 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 able, to, you're able to do that. I've, I've certainly not really thought about it or heard it explained in that way. And, it, and it's kind of obvious after the fact, but it's not, it's not really, you, you kind of think, well, yeah, oh, obviously. But then again, you try and do it and get in the habit of, you know, as you're coming off, a turnaround at a 12 bar, you're going into a solo and you want to have a certain phrase to expel that air before and to con consciously do it. That's, that's, that's not, that's not straightforward, especially if you're not used to it. Definitely. So, super... so we've talked about the, these different states, the, the kind of re relaxed, the full, the empty state we've talked about this idea of the, the, the nose push and, and, and ways you can think about exhaling uh, air to give you kind of more, more options. 
are there are, are there any uh, other aspects when we talk about active blues breathing that, that you want to mention i've seen i've seen you run workshops where you're getting groups of people to hold hold those notes and play that kind of answer call for a phrasing that you do and, and challenge people to really try and hold those notes for for longer and we've talked a little bit about the physicality in, uh, involved before before we move on to chords and tongue blockings right and anything anything else we want to deep dive on the the, clearly the big thing is learning to access and control your lower range of breathing. The upper range is simple, but if you video yourself and you see that distressed uh, puffer fish, I'm about to blow up, look too much, then you know you're spending too much time in your upper range of breathing. When you go into your lower range of breathing, you never see that distressed look upon your face. So the idea is a blues harmonica player or a roots harmonica player is to move it down as far as you comfortably can into your lower range of breathing because you don't have those obvious signs of distress on your face. And it there would be no argument. We could video anybody and and they could look at themselves and would say, yes, I look distressed. Well, that's yeah. because too much in the upper range. It's not a it's not a genius thing. It's just yeah. recognizing like what is really obvious if you take the time to look at photos and look at videos of yourself. Yeah. So, and, and also just to clarify, when, when you're talking about upper and lower range, this isn't a frequency thing or a, or a tone thing. This is upper range in terms of the outer extremity of breathing in and the lower range will be when you've pushed all the air out of your body when we talk about exactly. ranges. So, so in summary, to pick up an analogy, a jumping analogy early on, uh, I guess what we're saying is bend your knees yeah. <laughs> right before you play. Do the, do the breathing equivalent of bending your knees before yeah. you jump, right? Positively, not a natural thing to do, not natural. And I think it's reasonable to say that if you're, a, if you're younger, if you're teen, 20, 30, it's probably going to be easier to do that than if you're retired. Uh, it It's harder to reprogram that stuff, I think, and get physical in that way as you get older. Uh, but it's certainly this kind of breathing is the healthy breathing that people, therapists, would want you to do if you have any challenges with COPD. Um, right. They were really happy to have me... Uh, conduct COPD classes at the local, local hospital when we could still do that because I was all about breathing to the extreme long breaths and very important thing, but it's not natural. You have to make a point of doing it and check yourself on it. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I think we've got something monster happening here. I'm super, super, super happy. I don't, I'm not oh, aware good. of these kind of these kind of discussions happening. Uh, you can't do it on YouTube. So hopefully people will, well, sod them if they don't. I'm, I'm having a good time anyway. But uh, <laughs> I, that, I swear to you, that's most important to me. Uh, I'm having a good time I, and it looks to me like you're having a good time and that has to be paramount. Because what I, what I don't want to do is, is sort of edit out all the depth. I think that's what this is about and I think that's what you're about and, that, that, and that, that's what I want to put across in the recordings i'm enjoying this on the highest level i am enjoying cool. it on the highest level oh yeah so that's active blues breathing joe's second fundamental of playing the harmonica my personal takeaway here is this idea of that third breathing state where your lungs are essentially empty and this is something you deliberately have to do and bake into your techniques. It was super useful to hear Joe talking about it in that way. In the next episode, episode three, Joe and I are going to be talking about chords and tongue blocking, the third fundamental. If you've enjoyed this podcast, you can help by writing a review and giving it a rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can get in touch with your questions, comments and ideas by emailing info at leesankey.com. And just remains for me to say thanks for listening. And I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Replay. Until next time, keep well. How come 
when she'll hold my hand, I can walk like I'm ten feet tall, yes, I can, oh, how come?